oh, there's an echo. Should I call in the heroes? You know, it sounds like it. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. And thank you so much for making time. It's a crazy, crazy semester. And it's a crazy time of year. But I really do appreciate that you're here, or are here, not we're here. I think I'm a little loud. Do you think I'm a little loud? I feel like the sky is going to come down. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Behind my back, maybe, right? <laughs> No, I'm teasing. Well, thank you so much. And um, this has been a uh, Herculean effort on all of our parts to get the semester rolling. And all of you in the room, despite the fact that you have your day jobs and everything else and all the busyness of the semester, you made time to be here today. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for the efforts and the work that you and your teammates put forth this last year to get to today. And there's more work to come. We know there are bumps and there are hurdles and things that we need to work on. But I'll say, I've never worked with more talented people. You really are very, very talented. And you, um, you've just done things despite the resources and the, the mandate that we've had and the time crunches. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very, very, very much. Give yourselves a hand, guys. What we'd like to do today in our fall welcome back is to talk about some of the things that we've been working on for the last two years. Uh, many of you have been on various teams and put this information together. And um, we're going to talk about some of the guiding principles that the work that really guides our processes for how we do things at Penn West and the interactions, the planning, so that we can deliver the best possible, um, deliver our mission, which is educating people and helping them lift their lives to a better place through what we do on our different campuses. And as our one campus, the bigger picture campus. Guiding principles that we have identified pulled from a lot of the data and a lot of the comments that you have given us, that our students have given us, and the research we've done on our institution and our comprehensive mission, we've come up with five um, that will need to be continuously tweaked, tweaked but this, this is aspirant. This is where we want to be. So I'm going to talk about we offer, even though it's not quite 100% there yet. Okay. We offer education your way. And our programs are designed to meet the needs of our students for their career aspirations, whether their aspirations are to be a teacher with a four-year degree, or go on to become a nurse practitioner, doctorate in nursing science to teach nurse practitioners, uh, MBA, accounting degree, pre-law, pre-med, pre-farm, English, all of the things we do, art, technology, all of the things that we do. An example of education your way would be a student who must stop out because of a critical problem in the family, like a parent's health or a sister or sibling's health. They stop out for a little while. We figure out their plan so that they may be stopping out of coming to classes face to face. But maybe they're able to continue their program through guidance and support so they don't have to stop out completely. They opt out of day classes, or, and they wind up continuing their degree and their progression. We had a student, a good example of that. She did stop out. Her father did pass away. And then she came back. She continued. And then she came back full time and got her MBA. So that's education your way, tailoring things to our students. This is going to be particularly uh, creative and challenging work in the Academic Affairs Division because you know, some of our stuff is very uh, constructive, you know, constructed and very tight with accreditation. But there are ways to be extremely flexible and keep our students in the forefront. So education your way. We know our predominant population has been uh, 18 to 25 year olds, but one third of our population are in a different space. And that's another area where we can be extremely flexible. We know that people have all kinds of complex home situations. 
And it's less about coming to campus when we're convenient and more about what they need for us to help them walk across the stage. We are student ready. We meet students where they are. We help them navigate through their financial, their spiritual in a way, their personal, their academic challenges. We help them really transform their lives with the core mission of education. But with education goes everything else in a person's identity. And that's what we're gonna help them navigate. We know particularly this year that our students, like last year and the year before, mental health issues are at the fore. They're even more complex and more apparent in every aspect of campus life, whether they come up to a window and ask about financial aid, whether they are in the classroom and it's manifesting, in the residence halls when they commute in. We know that they're under a lot of uh, stress and have a lot of issues that are coming. And we are preparing for that. And we are prepared for that. And we will continue to refine that so that we're, we can mobilize our resources across campus and no one feels alone when they're supporting our students. We help them, we are student ready, prepared for that. That's the way the world is, we're ready. With the, we advocate for the members, all members of our community. Okay, so we build a sense of belonging in members of our community. Yeah, 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 this is like home, we all feel good, it's comfortable. It means that everybody who comes to campus sees that they belong here. They know they belong here with the procedures and the policies. They're not excluded. And also, um, when they leave and go home at night, or whether they're uh, graduating or students or employees, they have a deep sense of belonging from the institution. They get a sense that people really do care, and we're bonded together on our mission. We do things to support each other. We are Western PA. From the tip of Erie down to the toe near Western Virginia, we are the corridor of the West. We have a unique population. Even though our campus identities are different, uh, there's a lot of similarities. And we educate and transform people in the small rural communities and in the larger cities, like uh, Erie and Pittsburgh. And so uh, that's what we do. We have to listen to our career and our industry and our community leaders for what they think is important, and we supply the educated and prepared workforce for them. We want our people to graduate with good degrees, earn good livings, and uh, settle here. So we, we supply the Pennsylvania brain and talent, and we don't want them leaving and going to other places. So the more we can connect with employers and the kinds of things that they need based on our expertise as uh, teachers and also disciplinarians in different fields, that combination is a winning combination. And the more we can get um, internships for our students, the more they connect, the more they leave, they feel ready, and they're kind of bonded with the community. Might not be going home you know, to Warren, but it might be you know, settling in Edinburgh or somewhere <laughs> nearby. But Pennsylvania is the key <laughs> for us. Um, but we, we are Western PA, and we're, you know, we're kind of gritty, hardworking. We have a very strong work ethic. And that uh, comes across from our students. And we really, even though we complain sometimes, oh, they need to work harder, that last generation. No, they're hardworking. They're really great students. Uh, we empower and invest in our people and culture. Now, get, based on the efforts and the work that we've had to do this last bit of time, and the changes in employment and lots of things, it's hard to see that we're investing in our people and our culture. But we will, we will continue to provide supportive opportunities. Uh, Gwen Price is in the room, and she was part of a leadership program at another campus that we developed for faculty and staff at all le levels to prepare people with better sense of communication and skills and so forth. And that is, we'll be offering more of those kinds of programs for our employees and also more for uh, more specific, like talent management. That's something that we're going to invest in. If you think you're being underutilized or overworked, there's a way of looking at career matching so we can help people move up in the institution. We want to keep uh, our faculty and our staff because you're in the trenches, you know what's going on, you're talented, and we want to help you be prepared to do the best work you can do. And, um, and then, and if we want to be in a, in a place where people learn and they're not afraid to take on new things, but we get them the skills that they need and the equipment to do it. So those are the underpinning principles. We invest in our students, 
education is tailored to them, student ready. We advocate for inclusiveness and belonging, not just, you know, there's action, 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 but in a sense that feeling of belonging is really what we know we're doing all those things right. We're Western PA and we invest in you. We will take on a new operating model. One of the questions that we've had from people the last few months is, I don't know what to do, and I don't know who to call, and I don't know how to move things up the chain and, or move things down the chain. And So we've been working very hard on a clear operating model, a blueprint of how we do what we do and how we get there, so how we make it work, how we make this new organization of Penn West work. The thing about Penn West Edinburgh is we have so much talent here. And the next few months, we're going to be ref we're in the stage that I call refinement. You know, oh, we put all this together, and now we're in the processes. Something didn't work. How do we get to that next level? How do we make it work? How do we clean it up? So that's the process. The operating model has six different factors to it. Uh, it holds what we kind of talked about before. Some of the blue, the five pin pinnings, uh, underpinnings, or columns of what we do: our vision and our strategy. Our data and assessment, you'll be hearing a lot about measure, measure, measure going forward, and people will be held accountable for measurements. We'll identify what we need to do, and then we'll identify, are we tracking it, is it working? And then if it's not working, we reassess, figure out how to redeploy a plan. And so you'll be hearing a lot about data, because we have a lot of great ideas, but we need to see that they're actually working. It can't just feel good or feel right. It has to actually have data points to it. Um, technology and innovation. You're going to be hearing a lot about that. Right now, we're in the glitches of refining our technology and aligning all these systems. It's been a massive undertaking, particularly for all of the folks who deal with those complex systems, like registration, billing, IT, teaching, just about everybody in this room. But, um, but we're, we're looking at innovation using technology, because we now work across the globe, and certainly during three campuses, but we do work globally our ways of working, our governance, and also our people and our culture. And I'm going to go into these a little bit more now. So vision and strategy. So we'll ensure that our guiding principles, our focus areas, and our strategic goals are clearly communicated, articulated, and all, to all people on the university. So that's going to require you to do a little homework I think Jim Geiger's team put out a, a chronology of all of the information that we've, we've communicated over the last year or so, right, Jim, and the dates and everything. That's a little bit of homework, and I know you're busy right now, but go in there and dig into it, because we really need to understand what we've given birth to and how it's going to work and what's important about it. And so that's, that's the communication on your end. Our job is if we don't have it out there, we need to continue to get it out there to you in a timely fashion. Okay. Next. People and culture, you know, we want to foster a healthy and transparent culture where employee engagement matters. Civility and learning and development is critical. We, we tell our students, you got to learn, you got to be lifelong learners, you know, you, then we say, oh, I don't like change, this is tough. You know, so we want to really make sure that we support that so that uh, we all are learning along, because 10 years ago, the police department operated one way. 10 years ago, the registrar's office operated another way. Personnel, things change all the time. I think of the field of education, the profession of education. The classroom 10 years ago was totally different from what's going on right now. Certainly, as a former nurse, you go into a hospital, every time I go to get a checkup, there's some new gadget to take my temperature. It's just I thought it was the head, now it's something else. You know, It's always changing. So uh, that's, but that's really what we want, and we want people to collaborate. So a lot more of this than sorry, no, that we don't do that here. And so we'll be doing a lot more of this kind of work together to support each other, to lift each other up. Okay. This is very exciting. Uh, we want to encourage and facilitate the respectful sharing of ideas information and policy development and promote civil discourse. You'll see I keep using the word civil because we all get really angry about things and, and it's okay to be angry and to disagree. It's not okay to treat somebody like a piece of garbage. And some of us have felt that, that way when people are angry and that's, that's not okay. So we just want to be able to foster that environment and to help people do it in, that, in a, a way that's respectful. And, um, but 
we had faculty senate, we have various governance kinds of, we have external governance, we have our council of trustees, which uh, has, we now have a council of trustees that represent all three campuses, and also a student trustee from each campus uh, who sit on our governing council now. So that's externally, and they give us input you know, from our constituents. But internally, we have pretty much had faculty senate to some variation on different campuses. But what we haven't had is a university assembly. And that's what we are birthing this fall. We're going to have a university assembly where individuals from various departments, um, faculty and non-faculty, uh, staff, some represented, uh, some non-represented, who will serve as the voice for all of you. And I expect many of you will put your names in and figure out this process. There's, it's going to be run by uh, Kelly, um, Moran Burpinski, and uh, Jamie Phillips from the Clarion campus, who's a faculty member. He was on governance for the, he was the state representative for governance with the BOG, Board of Governors. So that gets launched this fall. And uh, if you have questions about how that will be, Kelly can talk about that in the Q&A section. But it's very exciting because it matters. It, it, you know, when things or decisions are made in a vacuum, bad outcomes happen. So, okay. Data and assessment. Oh, we will ensure that our data is friendly, user friendly. And the, the, the institutional research folks will often ask, you know, why are we doing this report? Who reads it and is it necessary? You know, we want the reports to be user friendly, appropriate, and not busy work. Nobody likes to collect data, put it in an electronic file cabinet, and never see it again. So, that's, uh, so you'll be seeing that. And the nice thing about our data and assessment, we've already got a really good foundation with this because of the work that we have done for the last two years with the birth of this, in, uh, this new institution. So we've got some of it already in the works. So that's good. We don't have to repeat a lot of stuff. And then we will be refining. And we'll be eliminating stuff that's no longer necessary. Right, Matt? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, technology and innovation I talked about before. I do think I want to pick on Erin just a little bit uh, because the um, innovation with the global campus, uh, global online, I mean, she's, she's kind of right there on the edge working with staff and faculty and instruction designers, and you've got something maybe you want to add to that. All right, ways of working, implementing university-wide system for planning and processes, department team charters, and flow of information and technology. So we're, those are being refined and worked on right now. Next. So the team charter, or the department charter, the unit charter, it stands for uh, what the team does and how they operate, what you believe in and what your core values are. Let's go to the next one. Oh, I love this picture. This is a good example of uh, innovation. The, the, living, the team charter is a living document. It's not something that's concrete, that once it's written out, it's always there. The, the, the charter is something that is a touchstone for what we think is important now, and it will always be something that you review and refine going forward. So it's not made in stone, but it is something that connects us all to do our work in our units. And so it will provide us with the accountability that we all need, so when you know someone's not carrying their weight or someone's carrying too much weight, we can help them. Um, it also establishes a shared vision for the work we do in our unit and those who we serve. Uh, some of us actually don't serve students. Some of us in our units serve you. And so that's, that's a, just a different uh, uh, way of looking at it. And also it improves communication and you know, it's like, okay, this is what we do here. Let's go back to our charter and what we've all committed to. We're all committed to it. And it serves, it creates good synergy, but also positive communication. The elements include, our, I love this one, core values. Like, what do you really care about? Because each department cares about something that, we all say we care about students, 
But specifically, it might mean something to, you know, in, in John's area, it might have something to do with competence is really important so we don't make these mistakes. We have responsibility for facilities that could mean lives are at danger. Whereas in uh, Susan's department, it might be something more related to uh, wellness and mental health for employees and students. So it, those are the core values. The roles, what do members do? What are their roles? Let's define those so there's not overlap and waste of energy. And also, uh, how do we know we're successful? What are our identifiers? With athletics, you know, usually we say it's winning, but I look at athletics as much more full-bodied than that. I mean, we transform lives, we teach leadership, the GPAs, usually the students are, you know, through the roof, their debt is low, they become great men and women. Okay, so those are different kind of measurables, and we like them to win too, so. And what are our group norms? How do we do our business here? And the information flow, how does the meeting cadence work? Because nobody likes to waste their time at meetings. And the purpose, uh, the, what is our key purpose? What is the mission of this unit as it applies to the mission of Penn West? This is also very exciting. I know, I know you say like strategic planning. How exciting is that? Ooh. But actually, it's very exciting because we get to create our future through strategic planning. And we've already done a lot of work on this through the last couple of years. We've laid out a lot of stuff already. So right now, go ahead, put the next one on. The, um, we have plans for this, and we have two leaders who are going to co-lead it. We have the uh, Susan Fenske, who's uh, our senior vice president for, uh, you have a long title. Can you say, everybody, what your title is? OK, and also she has the police. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of this and that. But, but strategic, but the, the whole idea of mapping out our success and then we'll have a faculty member uh, who will help co-lead the process. And we're working on the, those discussions uh, this week. So um, the build on the plans of the three United campuses that we've already been working on, but also we will engage a variety of stakeholders, us, the students, the communities, our external uh, constituents, and so forth. Uh, some of you in the room who work for the foundation, understand it's very important to talk to alumni, donors, and people who have degrees and, and business leaders. And then they will give us some input and we'll also refine the work. And then the comprehensive plan, this, as a result of what we do with our strategic planning process, we'll also have the University Planning Council. No pressure there, right, Chuck? We'll also have the uh, University Planning Council to monitor and assess the initiatives identified in our plan. So it will not be something we create, put on a shelf, and never look at it again. It'll be a living document that the University Planning Council will, uh, will help us keep on track. And there'll be leadership from the different aspects of our campuses to do that work. Uh, that's shared governance. That's really, and also keeping everyone accountable. Are we meeting with our goals? Are we doing our plans? So I'm gonna squeeze in a little bit here. So August, we have our core strategic planning committee in place. September, our subcommittees. October, we'll synthesize ex the existing work that's been done and prepare for the stakeholder input. And then we move through January with that various process assessment, gathering data, planning it, and then by August, we'll launch it. So that is pretty great. One year, some people say strategic planning takes two. We don't have two years, so we're doing it in one. So, okay. And um, that, there you have it. So, uh, but before we get to the Q&A period again, um, I do want to say thank you so much for everything that you've been doing for our students and for one another this last little while. And now we get to open it up for questions that you might have. The first, I'd like you to kind of just sit in your circle, talk to folks, and see if you can identify some questions that maybe came up that you've been thinking about and then we'll, we'll open it up. So for about two minutes, just talk with one another, and then we'll go ahead and start the Q&A period. Do we have a microphone that we're gonna use? Good. I had tea. Do you have questions? <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. So there's been a good amount of chatter. Let's see if we have any questions. Let's see, we have any brave souls that want to ask some questions? We have a question back here, Rachel. So my question is this, we, we started to spend some money uh, out of our budget, you know, but the money has not shown up in the, underneath the, the budget line item. So I, you know, we have new, we have new uh, codes and stuff for, for fundraise. But when I talked to our business manager, she said there's, the money hasn't been transferred over there yet. So how long will that take? And um, can we continue to spend money out of that? So the best place to go is send an email telling uh, budget at penwest.edu. Okay. So they're monitoring that account for all these questions. Um, they're trying to get ready for the CPP right now, and they're trying to get the personnel complement correct, since it accounts for about 80% of our budget. But you're not the only person that has this kind of question because they did a quick and dirty job to get everybody up and running, but not all budgets were loaded where they needed to be. So send them a note at that email address and they'll get back to you. And the follow-up to that is I have a grant um, and we don't have a new grant uh, code yet. So we're trying to spend it on our student work study and stuff like that and there's no, so our secretary can't. And she'll forward it to the grant accountant. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings up um, uh, another point. Jim, can you talk about the question uh, that you have? That question, when people click that link, if they have a question or a concern about, can you can you tell folks about that? Thank you. Yeah. So as part of the communication that we sent out and have on the penwest.edu site, there's a form for questions. And there's someone on this very campus that is uh, looking at those questions. Thank you very much. Um, and then finding the right person to answer them um, and getting that answer out. And when we see that we're getting the same question a couple of times, we are looking at how do we communicate that back out to everybody. So it's uh, kind of a growing, um, helping us to grow the types and kinds of communications that go out. Jim, can you tell everybody who you are and then also who the person is who's going to answer those, get the questions to us? <laughs> I am Jim Geiger. I'm the vice Pre senior vice president for university advancement, I and I am the Clarion campus administrator. Kristen, you, what's your title? Sorry. Communications director. Communications director. Sorry. Um, so we have an advancement. We have communications and marketing. We have branding with Bill. We have alumni engagement with Amanda. We have fundraising with all the fundraisers. Raise your hands. Tony, and then the folks here on this campus that you know. Um, and then Chuck is here from the foundation. Thank, Chuck, thank you for being here. Someone's going to ask about the directory. Um, <laughs> when will there be a directory? Great question. So IT is working on the, uh, the directory, may have it this week. They're pulling the information from SAP. They need to put it through a database that then we can launch out on the website. So that's coming. If you're wanting to know what it will look like, it will resemble the CalU People Finder. So that's just kind of their name, the People Finder. But you can be able to search by department or by name. Um, students will not be in that directory. Students will be accessible through Banner. So if you have access to Banner and need to get in touch with students, that's how you do it. If you don't have access to Banner and you need to get in touch with students, then IT will help you get connected with Banner. Is there anybody from IT here? Sorry, did I uh, <laughs> did I commit you to anything that's? Well, you're on target so far. And actually, there's uh, a photo IT resident. You guys from here in Israel. Thank you. Occurring because we had so many requests for a student directory. Thank you. And uh, just this week, there's been several that came in and uh, working with the team there to come up with a, a solution, which is going to be a custom solution. I, I don't have any time frame on that yet, but it's on the heels of the uh, employee directory for sure. Uh, you can also maybe talk a little bit about why there's some concern about everyone having access to the student directory. Yeah, there's, well, there's the main concern is the FERPA requirements. Uh, you just can't, you know, broadcast a student's information out there without 
interfering with some sort of FERPA requirements that are out there. There are students with, uh, with holds on, on, their, on their accounts. That, and so you have to factor all that in and you have to look at all that data. So you gotta, you gotta cross query all the tables that have all that information to be able to make sure that you have a directory that is uh, not breaking any of those rules. So we have to look at all that. Thank you. <laughs> Org charts. Thank you. Org charts, we were just discussing that here. We are on version 19, I saw this morning. Um, we're going to cut it off this week and put them up. Um, I just ask for your patience because, as we all know, things change. So at least it's a, it's a fairly high-level org chart, so that will be helpful. Um, and then that, in conjunction with the directory, should get folks a better opportunity to find out where you need to go to get help. Um, Scott also has a very nice um, who to call for what form that we're going to um, put a communication around it and send it out. So it's kind of really like just what it says. If you need this, this is the person you go to. So we're working on that. Scott, thank you for that. Aaron, can you talk a little bit about the change in your division and what you now are in charge of? Sure. I'm Erin Lake, and I'm leading enrollment and global online now, as of uh, two weeks ago. Very excited about the opportunity to um, just sort of break down a few silos and uh, make things work really efficiently. I did want to share with you some numbers today. Um, all three campuses are uh, reflecting declines. But um, there are some bright spots. Um, overall, on Monday, we had 13,141 students. And we worked hard for every single one of them. So congratulations on that. We uh, are down 1,549 headcount, which represents a 10% decline. But at Edinburgh, we had very strong showing, thanks to Diane and her team, three years of increases with new freshmen and improvement in transfer. So great job. Yeah. They work so hard, everyone has. So um, we will be working on an integrated recruitment strategy very soon, bringing it all together. I don't want to be here next year saying we're in a decline, OK? Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Aaron. Appreciate it. <laughs> will you introduce yourself? Who you spoke before? No, I, I already asked my question. No, no, say who you are. So oh, I, I'm Jim Glatch. I'm the uh, head wheelchair basketball coach. Thank you. Thank you. All right, more questions? Susan, can you talk a little bit about the changes we've done in mental health? I can, and I can also call in a guest speaker who's here with his head down somewhere. There he is walking in the door! <laughs> Welcome to the room, Assistant Vice President for Student Wellness, Jim McGee. Um, we have been working very hard over the last six months to standardize the behavioral intervention model across all three campuses. So. We have fully functional mirrors of teams across the three campuses who are taking in all of your referrals uh, about student concerns and then triaging what needs to happen with each of those students. And as Jim and I were walking into Cal's campus yesterday, he said, it was a busy weekend. We've got a lot of bit referrals. And my response, which he hates, and he says it's the wrong response, but it's the right response is, that's good, the model's working. And we knew that, and actually the metric associated with implementing these behavioral intervention teams and standardizing it was increase in the number of reports. Check the box, we have increased the number of reports across all three campuses. So we welcome all of your referrals, big or small, whatever is sitting not quite right in your head about a student, it's a piece of the puzzle. Every student is a puzzle that we're trying to put together if there's something that's a tiny concern that takes you a moment to fill out a referral, we want to know that because a professor could have a piece of it, the Center for Wellness could have a piece of it, Residence Life could have a piece of it, one of the clerks in the bookstore could have a piece of it. We all touch students in so many different ways and when we have the whole picture and all of the pieces, we can put that together and get the student the help that they need and keep them here. So. Thank you for all of your referrals. Um, this has been a, a really important project uh, headed by Student Affairs, but certainly in partnership with all of you. So thank you for that. 
Jimmy, is there anything you'd like to add about mental health? Well said. <laughs> I offered. Well, the question came up yesterday, um, if, a, if someone does need to make a referral, where are the forms, or how do they do that? I'm going to let Jimmy answer it today, because I, I took it yesterday. Did you just tell him? <laughs> I had help. Uh, yes, uh, we do not have a singular way to report it, but we have on the website, the uh, behavior intervention site, there is one for each campus. And as Dr. Fenske said, no, no big or small report. Uh, we get a lot, and, and many people in the room don't know who's already reported, so every puzzle piece helps us uh, as a team sit down and, and meet the needs. Uh, as a number-wise, we're probably pretty close to where we were in the past. As a serious level, of the ones we're getting are, is more serious than has in the past. So we appreciate anything you're doing in terms of reporting, see something, say something, and letting us know so we can meet and stay on top of it. So let me be more concrete. I'm at a, a, a desk in the library working, and a uh, student's been coming in for a couple of years. Uh, this time, they come in and they look a little bit off. I'm just really uncomfortable. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but I don't want to report because, like, you know, maybe I'm being paranoid. Uh, what do I do? Yeah, that's a, Dr. Dale, perfect way to put in a report. Just, you know, uh, I've been working with so-and-so for a long time. Uh, their hygiene's a little down. Uh, they don't miss class, they're starting to miss class. Uh, their attitude has changed. We've gotten a lot of just similar ones that week, you know. Uh, I've seen so-and-so at noon every day come into the rec center, and I haven't seen that person in a week. Don't know what's happening. And that's a perfect way just to report that. So who would they report that to? Just on the, the bit link online. It's on each of the websites. It'll walk you right through. It's, it's a short, uh, you can do it anonymous if you'd like. Uh, but, you know, the people that do put their name, we might call you after to follow up to get some more information. Thank you. That's really helpful. I see that our law enforcement has, uh, <laughs> professionals has arrived. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Um, Scott, I hear a rumor that the, uh, we talked about this this morning, that the academic array isn't done. Can you reframe that for me and tell me what's really happening? Trying to get my blood pressure up. I, I am. <laughs> did I work? Did it uh, work? <laughs> yeah, as everybody knows, the Africa pandemic array is complete. It was complete last November. Uh, however, it is complicated because the grad programs, uh, as many of you know, are, are synthesized. We have already admitted students into the new programs, but we still have legacy programs. And with the undergraduate on, on the Penn West website, the new array is, is on that. And all, you know, all the faculty are working really hard right now to synthesize those undergrad programs by the end of December, I see Gwen putting, kind of putting her head down, but by the end of December, we need those done because Diane, Aaron, and their teams need that information in order to show students what we're offering. Right now, they know, they know what it is from a name, but they don't know what's in it until we synthesize it. And I think part of our own rhetoric has kind of caused some of the confusion that you're talking about, Dr. Dale, because we talk about how we know what it is, and we can we could talk about some good points we expect from these programs, but then we talk about how until it's synthesized, you know, we really can't tell you the, the details of it. And I think that's being misconstrued as, since it's not synthesized, we don't yet have the array, and we do. But it is, it, as I said, it is complicated because starting next fall, we will be admitting to the new array, but we will still have students in legacy programs at all three campuses. So the array is gonna look massive. If you're sitting at the chancellor's office, they're gonna say, what are you guys doing that you've got this huge array? And we've already had to have those conversations with them. We're in teach out mode. Those have to be taught out. The expectation is that the way we'll teach those out is by crosswalking the courses from the legacy programs into the new courses and the new programs. That will create efficiency. And it'll also allow the students to take the new, the new courses that we've created based on best practices, based on the, the the innovations within the discipline. So bottom line this for me, I'm not a faculty member, even though I was a faculty member, and, I, and we did curriculum review every year and revised it every year in my program. Um, so it's ever changing, but it was done and ready for the students. What do folks tell people when they hear, oh, I hear the academic array is not done? What should they say simply without synthesis? <laughs> <laughs> Penn West has an academic array, but you have to remember that academic arrays are ever changing because the disciplines change and the needs of the region change. Okay, so we're student ready. Yep. 
Gotcha. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Somebody had a question about lapel pins. Who was that? Andy Pushcheck, Education Leadership. A lot of what I do is in schools with superintendents and principals, and they love nothing more than a lapel pin when I walk into their office. Um, some of them are still proudly wearing our legacy Edinburgh pins. Yeah. We do have a few of the family pins still out there. I'd like to get those replaced. Um, just didn't know if there is a timeline for lapel pins. So. Thank we you. Can, we thank you very much. Jim. <laughs> Not that, Jim. <laughs> Lapel pins. Um, Bill. <laughs> so uh, Bill's team is working feverishly on branding items, so forth. Excuse me. So we're seeing more and more. I think your bookstore downstairs may have more actual Pin West Edinburgh gear than the others at this point, it seems like. Does that sound fair to you that travel around? Um, so I think things like that, we just need to catch them and um, get, them, get them ordered and get them together. You're welcome. Burger, B-E-R-G-E-R. I heard a rumor that there are uh, very few academic deans from the Edinburgh campus. Who could answer that question and tell me if that's true or not? Oh, Scott. Oh, Gwen. <laughs> oh, Pam. Oh, Mary. <laughs> when we've replaced people as people have left and as we made the position appointments, we were trying to appoint people who were the best people for the position regardless of where they were from. But we did take recognition that there needs to be some balance. Um, but we never made a decision on a hire based on that. So, yeah, when we first made appointments, Edinburgh was short on deans. Um, I was on the campus, but we didn't have any deans on the campus per se. But because of some transition that occurred over, over the summer, it's really balanced itself out. So now we have two deans on Edinburgh's campus, Mary Panacea Curtin for Arts and Humanities and Jim Fisher for Social Science and Human Services. We also have an associate dean here for Health Sciences, Craig Coleman, you know, he was just appointed. That will be coming out at, uh, soon. Uh, but just to let you know, he, he's now working in the College of Health Sciences. So that is balanced out pretty well. At, at the Penn West California campus, we have one dean, uh, Brenda Fredette, who's the dean for natural sciences. And we also have two associate deans. One, for, one is um, Tom Wickham, also for natural sciences, and Bob Mahalik, who's for social science and human services. At the Clarion campus, we have Gwen Price for education, but she's also going to be spending a lot of time up here because she's also serving as now as an associate provost for students and graduate studies. I can see her really excited about that. We are. Uh, and she's <laughs> and she is going to spend a lot of time up here for that. And the reason for that is there are th now three associate provosts, and we're trying to have them on each campus to have a go-to on each campus so that I could be more going around to the campuses and also thinking at a higher level than, than the operational stuff. They've taken a lot off my plate and helped me a ton. And the deans have also each taken on a role as an assistant to the provost and taken on some of the provostial roles that are, were taken on by some of the associate uh, provosts. As, you know, as we've gone through the last six to eight months, we've noticed some of the workload variation that was occurring amongst the two associate provosts. So we took some stuff out, and the deans were saying, hey, how can we help? And we said, oh, OK. You know, and here, here's a bullet that from, that, from their area of responsibility to yours. Uh, Clarion, Deb, Deb Kelly is the dean for health sciences. Uh, and so she, she's working there. She also, uh, I just got the recommendation for her associate dean. Do you remember what, where that landed? I know that, that, that's. Is Coleman. Is Coleman? Okay, that's right. That, that was the uh, there was it was Mary's. Mary, Mary, your associate dean is at Clarion, and that is Melissa Price. Was Kubi now Price? Right. Okay. So there's an associate dean there. For that, and then Phil Fries, who is the Dean for Business Communication and Information Systems, is at Clarion. 
and he has an assistant dean, Juan East Vega, who's also located there. So it's pretty well spread out uh, across Penn West, not necessarily intentionally trying to do it that way, but it worked out well so that we have good representation. So um, and each campus has administrative support for the deans, and each dean has a primary administrative support and a secondary, and the secondary then serves as backup for the, the other deans when they visit that campus. Each campus has hoteling space, we're using that term broadly, where there is a space where there's shared offices, where when somebody comes on the campus, they can use that office. Deans can use it, we're gonna allow chairs to use it. If they come on campus, leads to use it. Here it is the, uh, deans, the old dean suite in Butterfield that has some extra space that we've outfitted for that purpose. So somebody could just come in with their laptop if you happen to have to get on a Zoom meeting you can go in that office and have some privacy. Which brings me to another point. Gwen, how many years did you work at Edinburgh University? That's a good question. Um, not long enough. I worked here about seven years right, right. before going to Clarion. And so it's been uh, Kind of cool, actually, uh, for it all to come back around. So it's nice to see familiar face, faces. And Mary, you have something that you're in charge of in addition to the, your college. Uh, yeah, I'm the liaison to the provost's office for the honors college. program and also for the Center for Faculty Excellence. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of things uh, about hoteling space. Uh, this, there's something that some of you have gone to meetings before that I, I like to do. Uh, in addition to asking questions, I also like to do, uh, is it real or is it a rumor? And so uh, I will end today with thanks, and is it a real or is this real or rumor? So um, people say, which house do you live in? Where do you spend most of your time when you're on campuses? And I say to folks, well, I rotate equally to each campus. And uh, that does require some driving time. I do quite a bit of carpooling, and that's very, very helpful. Um, so I do rotate. And then I spend a good bulk of time in Erie or Pittsburgh and down at the RLA Center uh, in Cranberry Township. But I don't live on any campus. I have a room on every campus. And so uh, it's a nice locked room where I have clothes and toiletries and things like that. But the other rooms, which are abundant on each campus at the presidential residence, are open to those of you who work first come, first serve, free, with coffee <laughs> and Wi-Fi and tea. So anyone can use those. And Kelly can tell you a little bit about uh, who you would contact to use those things. Uh, it's, it's, we keep the historical preservation of the campus presidential residence, which is very important to our history and our legacies, but it's open no matter what your rank is. I'm actually going to hand this right back to Rachel because she manages it at Edinburgh, and you can talk about who manages it. At the other two, yeah. Okay, well, um, obviously you would contact me um, if uh, you needed space at the Commonwealth House. Um, for Cal, um, uh, you would contact uh, Stacy, either yeah, Stacy Tedro, Tedro. Um, or Anna, and then at um, the Clarion campus, you would contact Kathy Werner. Okay, yeah, and uh, I do own a house uh, in the in the Erie County, and uh, and my husband is retired; he lives there full time, but I travel, so that's uh, so that is real, and uh, and the other stuff that's out there. It's a lot of fun rumors. So I want, oh yes, Scott. Oh, sure, thank you. I can, I can expand. Kelly, can you talk about the RLA Center? So the RLA Center is in Cranberry. It's a nice spot because it's very central to all three campus locations. Um, Len Kulo and others of us meet there on a regular basis for our meetings. It's nice because you don't have to drive from Erie down to Cal or to Clarion. You can reach out to Stacy Tedro in the president's office, and she manages all the reservations for that. And it's a really nice space. It's modern. Um, there's outdoor spaces. There's conference rooms, board rooms. You can, for an extra charge, you can rent a larger auditorium like this if you need to. Um, but we've been using it a lot. Um, it's very popular because you don't have to stay overnight. You can go, 
have your meeting, and for most of us, you can drive home and be with your family that evening. So yeah, it's very it's about nice. an hour and 15 minutes from most campuses. So, and it's got Wi-Fi and all kinds of things. And for those of you who like to go out for a fun lunch, there's restaurants everywhere around the place. Okay, so catering there is uh, you have to order ahead. So that's kind of a little bit about the RLA, and it's centrally located. Again, thank you, everybody, and give yourselves a hand for such a hardworking year. Thank you. Thanks for coming.